Well, glad everybody could join us for our Wednesday evening teaching service. If, if I'm here, it's going to be teaching. <laughs> I can guarantee. All righty. By the way, if you've, if you've never seen the uh, Louisiana Chef, that's where I get that phrase, guarantee. Yeah. He used to do some neat commercial uh, uh, cooking things, and I used to get a kick out of watching him. But anyway, um, Pastor, as you can tell, is not here. So uh, he's enjoying some time off, I think, down at the beach, right? Is he still down there? I know he was going this weekend for the Raymond meeting, but uh, at any rate, I'm glad everybody came out. I talked about it on my radio program, so I was hoping we'd get some folks in from there, but uh, that's all right. They can catch it later. Video delay. <laughs> and those of you that are watching on the internet, I appreciate y'all tuning in. Uh, we're going to receive the offering at the end of the service, so let's go ahead and... Uh, and open our Bibles. I want to go uh, first of all to Matthew chapter 22. So, y'all find your place there. I trust you are bringing your Bible. I brought mine on my phone. Uh, pastors wanting to start bringing paper bound or paper Bibles <laughs> bound in leather. Uh, and I found mine and pulled it out. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna start bringing it with me. But uh, tonight I'll remain electronic. Uh, but at any rate. We're going to be talking about a topic that I, as I studied this, it's really interesting study, uh, on the diligence factor. The diligence factor. There's a lot of people who have asked me through the years, and I mean years, because <laughs> I've been studying and believing and receiving the Word of Faith uh, message for many, 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 many years. And uh, er ever since, even when I was in college in the 70s, uh, I was listening to Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, and so forth. And I had people even back then ask me this question. How come is it? <laughs> no, not using proper English. How come is it that I use my faith, I do everything that Brother Hagin said to do, and it just doesn't work for me? Well, that is a question that each of us has to answer individually. Okay. And uh, one of the key areas that I think is a point that a lot of people miss is this point of diligence. So we're going to look at that. And in order to get into it, Matthew twenty-two thirty-four. 34, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying. Now notice he was testing him. This was not a friendly question. This is like a guy at a press conference asking the president, a question he hopes will, will trip him up. And so he asked this question, he says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And by the way, I'm reading out of the New King James uh, Version. So if, you, if you're wondering, how my Bible doesn't say that. Well, New King James does. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, we've heard that talked about, preached about in the past, and people talk like, well, you know, if you, if you got these two down, you got all the law and the prophets. All you need is just these two commandments. Well, I know where you're coming from. Jesus is talking about this like if you were to walk into a house and you had a peg next to the door and you hang your coat on it, you know, you hang, or your, your cat or whatever. This, these are the two commandments that everything hangs on. These are important, no question. But it is not by any means all the commandments summed up into these two. And we're going to talk a little bit about the word commandment here in a few minutes. And don't let that throw you. A lot of Word of Faith folk get all bent out of shape when you start talking about commandments. Ah, oh, Dr. Bill, you're trying to put me under the law. You know, and they get all nervous talking about a commandment. Well, a commandment, if you look it up in the, in the Greek in the New Testament, the word commandment used there literally means an authoritative prescription. 
Now, when you go to your doctor, and maybe you've got some little, I don't know, some little infection or something, and he diagnoses it, and he says, I'm going to prescribe some antibiotics to you. You take these antibiotics twice a day without fail. You need to follow the prescription. If you do that, then this will clear up. And sure enough, if you follow the prescription and you take the medicine the way you're supposed to, then within two or three days, what do you know? The infection's gone. And, you know, you, it, you don't have to deal with it anymore. You don't have to deal with the symptoms anymore. Now, he usually says, keep taking them <laughs> till you take them all up. And a lot of people stop then and then it drops out of their system and they don't get the full effect. So you got to take it according to the authoritative prescription. It's authoritative because the doctor ought to know what he's doing. You know, I mean, if it's just Joe on the street, no offense, Joe, <laughs> on the street saying, yeah, take these, they really help me, and you don't even know what's in the bottle, that's not very authoritative. So you go to a doctor because of his expertise. You go to the doctor because he hopefully knows what he's talking about. Now, you know, my personal experience is, is they're still practicing medicine. They haven't got it right yet. <laughs> All right? That's just my personal experience. When I ended up in the hospital, it seemed like they were flipping coins trying to figure out what was going on. <laughs> but anyway, that aside, an authoritative prescription is not a bad thing. It's not something you ought to be fighting. And really, that's what the commandments of the Lord are. Are authoritative prescriptions for us on how to live, how to think, how to speak, how to act. All of those things are what the Word of God says are commandments. And he lays them out in the Word and, and they're simple to see. And there's another scripture that says that his commandments are not grievous. That's a good King James phrase. It means it's not hard. They're not hard on you. God's not just being hard on you for the sake of being hard on you. I know a lot of Christians kind of feel that way sometimes. The Lord's just trying to cramp my style. <laughs> no, he's not. He knows what works. He knows what will bless you. And if you follow his authoritative prescriptions for life, you'll be blessed. Now, we just quoted that scripture from Jesus in Matthew 22 in verse 35 and going through verse 40. Let's look now at Joshua chapter 22. Joshua chapter 22, verse 5. This is what Brother Kenneth Hagin used to call the golden text. This is what we're basing our study on is this particular verse of Scripture. So let's take a look at it. But take diligent, notice the word diligent, underline that in your mind. But take diligent heed to do the commandment and the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, his authoritative prescriptions, and to cleave unto him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Now that, in a nutshell, is really what we're talking about here. Being diligent to do what God said to do. Now in order to put this in context, I think it's good to read the context of Joshua chapter 22. Now I'm going to be reading this out of the New Living Version, which is a kind of an interesting version. It's, it's a bit of a bit of a paraphrase, but it's not one man's paraphrase. There were translators that got together and came to a consensus on how to make this a modern translation. So it's a little better than the old Living Bible, which was just Kenneth Taylor's paraphrase, one guy. Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't necessarily recommend the NLV for, for personal study all the time, but it does state things in a very modern and clear way. So let's begin in verse 1. Then Joshua called together the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And he told them, I want you to think about this while we read this. These are the Jews. Now it's a, a subset. It's just a few of the tribes. But you remember the reputation of the Jews <laughs> dealing with God? Seemed like he was always said, you guys are a stiff-necked 
people. You don't obey what I'm telling you to do. You're building golden calves out in the wilderness to worship. I mean, a bunch of knuckleheads. That was their rep, okay? Their reputation preceded them as far as we're concerned. We look back on the Jews and think, you know, I'm talking about the, the Israelites back in the, in the day. Uh, man, these guys, they just can't get it together. But look now what he says about these few people here. He told them, you've done as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. Wow. And you have obeyed every order I have given you. Man, these guys had it together. Let's keep reading. During all this time, you have not deserted the other tribes. You've been careful to obey the commands of the Lord your God right up to the present day. And now, the Lord your God has given the other tribes rest, as he promised them. So go back home to the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you as your possession on the east side of the Jordan River. But be very careful or diligent, because that's, that's what we're talking about, it's diligence. Be diligent to obey all the commands and the instructions that Moses gave to you. Love the Lord your God, walk in all his ways, obey his commands, hold firmly to him, and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away, and they went home. Moses had given the land of Bashan east of the Jordan River to the half-tribe of Manasseh. The other half of the tribe was given land west of the Jordan. As Joshua sent them away and blessed them, he said to them, Go back to your homes with the great wealth you have taken from your enemies, the vast herds of livestock, the silver, the gold, the bronze, the iron, the large supply of clothing. Share the plunder with your relatives." Well, you know, them sharing the plunder, them sharing the riches that they'd taken from their enemies, certainly spoke of them loving one another. So you see where Jesus is getting what he said in Matthew 22. It's a direct quote of verse 5 of Joshua 22, but then also love each other, and basically serve one another in, in so many words. And that's what they're doing. They're instructed to do here. So the men of Reuben, Gad, and half-tribe of Manasseh left the rest of Israel at Shiloh in the land of Cana. They started the journey back to their own land of Gilead, the territory that Moses, uh, the territory belonged to them according to God's command through Moses. So they did what Moses told them to do. They did what Joshua told them to do. And then they followed instructions and went home and shared their wealth of everything they had received from the enemy and did exactly what they were supposed to do. Well, praise the Lord. That's great. Well, it's the same thing with us. If we do what we're supposed to do and we hearken to the voice of the word, and because, you know, when you read, if you go back up here and read uh, verse 5 once again, in the King James, take diligent heed to do the commandment of the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you. We could take that and put it in the New Testament by saying, do what the Word of God says to do. Follow his instructions. Do his authoritative prescriptions. Love the Lord your God. Walk in all his ways. Well, that's walking according to the Word. Keep his commandments and cleave unto him, and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, the all your heart and all your soul, to me, again, speaks of diligence. So let's go back to our person that's trying to figure out why this stuff doesn't work for me. Well, I'll tell you what, I've noticed something about some Word of Faith folk. And I'm not really casting aspersions on anybody. This is just merely an observation, <laughs> as Brother Fred Price used to say. This is merely an observation. It seems to be a lot of Christians see the blessings that are written in the Word of God. They see what provision God has for them. And they go, whoo, hallelujah, I like that, I want that, that's for me. And then they just kind of sit back and go, okay, let it fall on me. Well, it's like Brother Hagin says, it's not going to fall on you like ripe cherries off a tree. Amen. Amen. You know, if it did, that'd be great. You could just lay out in the field and let the cherries fall and pop them in your mouth and, ooh, that'd be good. But that's not how he said it would come. He said you got to be diligent. 
And the diligence factor to me involves the fact that we have to keep his commandments, cleave unto him, serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. People that take a lackadaisical, for better word, attitude of, yeah, I'll just be blessed no matter what. Yeah, that, that smacks of what I call greasy grace. <laughs> the greasy grace teaching. And that is, it's all done for us. It's all done in advance. Well, guess what? It is done in advance. Je you know, Jesus bore our sicknesses. He carried our diseases. By his stripes we were healed. Jesus became poor that we might be made rich. All that's true. I'm not taking anything away from that. You know, the, the work, <laughs> the hard part has been done. But now we got to do the commandments. Oh, go ahead go with those commandments again, Dr. Bill. I don't want to hear about commandments. Authoritative prescriptions, remember. They're what's good for you to do. And the more you learn to think like God, the more you learn to walk like God. Remember, Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father do. I only say what I hear my Father say. If you take a note out of his book, so to speak, and start doing what you see God doing, and saying what you hear God saying, and make that your thought. You know, Brother Kenneth Copeland tells a story about uh, his kids. I think it was Kelly, when she was a little girl. And uh, they told her to do something, and she stomped her foot. She said, that's not my fault. <laughs> And I remember that story because I, 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 I've seen kids do that. They get all rebellious. It's not my fault. I'm, I'm not going to do that. Well, if we stomp our foot and say, Lord, I'm not going to do that, and we get rebellious, then we reap the results of the rebellion, which is those things don't come to pass. And are, are we then surprised when it doesn't work? No, we shouldn't be, because we need to think what God thinks, say what God says. See, God's not confused. You know, when I was laying in the hospital, <laughs> and the doctor said, you got a week to live, and he said, we're going to send you home to die, uh, he was very confident of what he was saying. <laughs> Matter of fact, he told me flat out, he says, now, we need you to do this because, frankly, we need the hospital bed for people we can help. We can't help you. You're going to die. So we're just going to send you home and let you die there. You know, you'll be more comfortable there anyway. Well, I'm thinking, you know, I'm like Brother Hagin. Brother Hagin, when he was laid on his deathbed, and the, and the uh, preacher came in and patted his hand and told him, just be patient, my boy. In a few days, it'll all be over. And he couldn't talk. But down inside, he was saying, I ain't dead yet. <laughs> and he just kept saying that inside. I ain't dead yet. And I felt the same way laying there in the hospital. I couldn't talk. I could only gesture, yay or nay, you know, with my thumb. Uh, but I'm laying there, and they ship me home. And I'm thinking, I ain't dead yet. <laughs> I'm going to, praise God, get up off this bed. I'm going to walk. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. I, I, got, I got work to do. I'm called of God to do certain things. And so I, I started locking in. So what did I have to be? I had to be diligent. I had to be listening to the Word of God. I was surrounding myself with the Word. Uh, Pastor Janie had given me you know, a sheet of paper that had all the scriptures printed out on it. And, and when I couldn't read it, which I couldn't initially because I couldn't speak, uh, Belinda would read it to me. And she'd just sit there beside the bed and read it to me, and read it to me, and read it to me. And I'd be sitting there going, that's right, that's right, I'm the healed of the Lord, hallelujah. Healed from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And I just kept meditating on that. To meditate, in the Hebrew, the word that's translated meditate, is to mutter, which means to speak, even under your breath. I couldn't speak very loudly. Now, I am known for my voice. I don't need a PA system. <laughs> I got a built-in one. <laughs> and even when I do radio spots, you know, you're listening to WFR.org, Word of Faith Radio. And I, I do the, the, what I call the FM DJ voice. Well, the thing is, I didn't have one back then when I was fighting all this stuff. 
I could barely talk. And it just barely came out. But I could murmur. I could murmur. So I'd be saying, the Lord is the strength of my life. I'd quote that scripture. The Lord is the strength of my life. I needed strength. I needed to be able to move. I needed to be able to move my arms and move my legs and be able to get up and, and walk and move. And it wasn't overnight, but over just a few short weeks. I was able to swing my legs out of bed and I'd sit in the bed and I'd fall over. <laughs> and then I'd get up and I'd do it again. And I'd get up and I'd do it again. And the more I, uh, you know, Belinda was feeding me gluten-free food, thankfully. And so I'm eating that and it's going into my body and making me stronger, making me stronger. And then I get where I could swing my legs out, put them to the side of the bed, and I was able to sit up. Well, that was a major victory. I'm sitting there. Wow, I'm just be able to sit up, you know. And then I'd get tired and I'd lay back down. But I kept doing it. And you have to be diligent. You have to keep working it. And so finally I got where I could get up and go to the bathroom. Hallelujah. That was, that was awesome. I was so tired of laying there in bed and having to deal with, you know, bedpans and everything else. And so then I got where I could go to the bathroom. I felt like I'd been liberated. But over time, I got stronger, I got stronger, got stronger, got where I could walk, got where I could do things again. The voice came back, hallelujah. <laughs> that was, boy, that was a miracle. I told Blinda, I said, man, I feel like I have come a long way. I can talk again. And she said, use your inside voice. <laughs> which, which is what she's always telling me for some reason. But anyway, <laughs> but I tell you what, I'm glad to have my voice back. It makes it so much easier to be on radio when you have a voice to speak with. <laughs> but at any rate, let's look at some of the benefits of diligence. Let's look at a few other scriptures. Proverbs 10, 4 says, He becometh poor, now think about this, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. And remember what I was saying about folks getting really kind of slack, not really studying the Word, not really hearing the Word, not really meditating on the Word, not going to church like they ought to. We're to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So we ought to be here. Hallelujah. Listen to pastor preach us the Word. So, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Now that's just natural wisdom as well as spiritual wisdom. In the natural, we know that if you go to work at a job, and you are diligent in that job, you put your, you know, as they say, nose to the grindstone, so to speak, but you do what is required of you in that job, that's when you advance. As a matter of fact, most of the time, you don't advance in a job until you're doing more than what is required of you. That's something this younger generation doesn't seem to understand. You know, they'll say, well, why haven't I been promoted? Well, <laughs> you're really not standing out while I'm doing the job, yeah, you're doing the job, just barely, but you're not achieving beyond that. And so it's that next step of being diligent, not dealing with a slack hand, but being diligent, putting your hand to it. And then you start to prosper. And then you start getting promoted. I never will forget when I started being promoted at work. And uh, the first time I went in to ask for promotion... I wasn't talking to my boss, I was talking to my boss's boss, because my boss had, had to go to uh, Basel, Switzerland. He was, that was headquarters at the time for Sibagagi Corporation. And my boss's boss didn't think much of me. I don't know what it was. I have no idea why he felt like he did, you know, bless his heart. Uh, but I went in and I said, you know, I've been here for a couple years now and I'd like to get a promotion. I'd like to be promoted. He said, Bill, I'm telling you, you're just now doing what we hired you to do. And I thought to myself, I don't think that's really true. Because when you hired me, you, it was to switch out tapes and do backups, which is operations work in the computer world. I had progressed on to where I was programming devices and doing device drivers in assembly language and, uh, you know, wiring closets with complete wiring and... I'd moved on. 
in terms of my responsibilities. And, and at that time, uh, because my boss was in Switzerland, uh, they brought in a guy from Switzerland to fill his place, but he didn't know anything about our shop. He didn't know anything about our computers. So I was having to tell him how to do what we needed to do to keep them all running. So in effect, I'm kind of doing his job and my job, which is why I felt, felt like it was probably a good idea to go ask for a raise or a promotion. And uh, so this guy, my boss's boss, he kind of blew me off. So I, you know, I'd been looking online to see what other positions might be available out in the community. And sure enough, there was one over at A&T University and they wanted a system manager. Well, I was a peon down here. System manager was way up here. So I went and interviewed, went to A&T, and uh, oh, they liked me. They thought, ooh, hey, we, we like this guy. So they hired me. So I go back to my boss's boss, and I gave him a two-week notice. <laughs> and he goes, uh, uh, apparently I didn't tell you what you wanted to hear. I said, no. <laughs> Because now he's left without anybody that knows the shop and how to run it. He's got a guy from Switzerland that I'm telling what to do in effect. And now I'm leaving. And he's like, <laughs> And I thought, well, you made your bed, dude. You got to lie in it now. <laughs> so, but I went off and became system manager over at A&T University. Was there for several years. But the thing is, I got there by being diligent, by stretching you know, by trying to do more than just what I'd been hired to do. And it paid off for me very handsomely in that I got a big raise, got a new position, a new title, and eventually even came back to that company I left six years later, or two years later. That's right, two years later, and I was there for six more years. That's what it was. Um, and then came in then as a really high-level position. So, whoo, hallelujah. Anyway, the Lord promotes you. Uh, but he that becometh poor that dealeth with the slack hand, the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Next verse, Proverbs 12, 24. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule. Like I said, I became a manager because I was diligent. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule. But the slothful shall be under tribute. Now, under tribute is a term that basically means taxed. <laughs> or, uh, you know, you have to pay the man. I don't like paying the man, just between you and me. I've never enjoyed taxes. It just never did ring my bell at all, okay? Uh, seems like I don't really get a whole lot for those taxes I'm paying. <laughs> just, just my observation, but at any rate, so I don't want to be in that position of the one to be paying the tribute or the tax, I want to be the one that's given the responsibility. I like having responsibility for a job and doing that job. It just, that's where I get my satisfaction. Next verse, Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of the sluggard, boy, that sounds, that's, the soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Now, you got to understand the way they fought back in those days. To be made fat was to be made rich. Okay, today we look at, well, I don't want to be made fat. <laughs> I understand, believe me. But the thing is, that's not what this is talking about. To be made fat means people who were overweight back in those days in the desert were only rich people. Think of it that way. Because they're the only ones who could afford to eat a lot of food. Most of the folks that were out there were working, you know, uh, their legs off and their arms off, trying to keep some food on the table. So those made fat were those that were made rich. So let's read it that way. Uh, the soul of the sluggard desires and hath nothing. Got big dreams, but never gets anything. But the soul of the diligent shall be made rich and have full provision. Let's put it that way. And that's the truth. That's the way it is. Next verse, Proverbs 21.5. I'm going to go through several of these quickly. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness or full provision. Let's put it that way. But of everyone that is hasty only to want. 
Now that is a good verse right there for anybody that's wanting to get involved in a get-rich-quick scheme. And I'm telling you, seems like Word of Faith folk, my experience again through the years, is that Word of Faith folk tend to be kind of suckers for the MLMs and the get-rich-quick schemes. I had a guy come to me when I was pastoring. I pastored back in 1980, 81 time frame. And a guy in my church came to me and says, Pastor, i got to share something with you. And my alarm bell started going ding, 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 ding. Because <laughs> I knew this guy. Bless his heart. He's a great guy. But he says, i got to share something with you. This, this is, you're going to get rich. I said, really? Oh, yeah, 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 you're going to get rich. So I said, uh, we, he said, go with me to a meeting. Well, again, my alarm goes ding, 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 ding. And I thought, well, bless his heart. I, I don't want to disappoint him. I guess I'll go. You know, it's not like I'm going to get involved in anything, but I'll go, you know. So I went to this meeting, and they were talking about selling insurance. And the, the way to get rich quick was to sell supplemental insurance. And you become an independent contractor with this company. And all you needed to do was buy in. And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> and this guy in the church told me, yeah, the Lord showed me that this is how he's going to make me rich. I said, well, <laughs> the word says that you need to be a tither. You need to be a giver. You need to do what the word of God says about finances, and the Lord will make you rich. <laughs> and he goes, well, yeah, but this is how he's going to do it. I said, I think I'll leave it alone, thank you. <laughs> well, guess what? He didn't stick with that even six months. He was off on another get-rich-quick scheme. And that's what this verse is really talking about. The thoughts of the diligence tend only to plenishness, but of everyone that is hasty, only to want. He never scored big with any of his get-rich-quick schemes. He was hasty to get made rich. Well, the thing is, that's not how you become wealthy is get rich quick schemes or MLMs or pyramid schemes or any of that kind of stuff. If it sounds too good to be true, I got news for you. It's probably too good to be true. Now I've missed a few things through the years that I should have done that I I didn't, I, well I'll tell you what it was. The Lord told me to do a few things and if I had followed through and done them to this day, I have regrets. Okay, and one of one of the biggest ones was this. Uh, my first wife contracted uh, breast cancer and passed away, and she had an insurance policy, and this policy paid off, and I had a chunk, of, pretty large chunk of money, and uh, I thought to myself at the time, you got to remember this was nineteen eighty seven ish. 86, 87, somewhere in that time frame. And uh, one of the things that just floated up in me, I believe it was a prompting, you should take some of this money, about, say, $25,000, take some of this money and invest it in Microsoft. Well, now that sounds like, well, yeah, of course. At that time, Microsoft was nobody. They were challenging IBM. Nobody knew who they were. I had heard of them. And I liked what I was seeing, but I, I got this prompting. You ought to, you ought to put twenty five thousand in Microsoft. And so, you know, I'm young, and, and, and I don't know much about finances. So I went to talk to a friend of mine who worked at Sibagagi, where I was working, and he was the finance wizard there. He was like, he was in charge of statistics and financial dealings, all this kind of stuff. And I greatly respected him. I mean, he had a he had a master's degree in it. And, and so I go to him and I say, Lewis, I've been thinking I need to invest in Microsoft. He goes, oh, no, that's too risky. You shouldn't do that. It's, it's a company. Nobody knows what's going to happen with that company. I mean, it could go under tomorrow. You shouldn't do that. Well, I kept thinking down in my spirit, no, I'm, I'm really getting a strong prompt that I need to do this. And I had the money. And it was sitting there. <laughs> but I said, okay, okay, Lewis thinks I shouldn't do this. All right. We figured up here recently 
what that would be worth today. And I'm thinking it was something like $80 million if I'd have just left it sitting there. And the dividends that would have come in, I'd have been worth about $80 million. Well, you know, that would have been nice. <laughs> But I have to look back on I even told Lewis later. I saw him many years later. I said, Lewis, yeah. You remember me telling you telling me not to invest in Microsoft? He goes, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. I said, It's okay. It's fine. I mean, I didn't hold a grudge or anything like that, but it was one of those I could have had a V8 moments. <laughs> you know what I mean? If I'd have just followed that prompting. But see, that's the thing. Be diligent to do what the Lord prompts you to do. Now, at that moment, at that particular time, that twenty-five thousand, I wouldn't. It wasn't money that I had saved up. It wasn't money that I needed to do anything with. I could have done it and never even noticed it, completely forgotten about it, and then been eighty million dollars richer later. <sighs> Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> but I look at it, Blend and I were talking about this. You know, that's where the devil stole some money from us. We're going to believe for sevenfold return on that. The thief stole it. He's got to return it. <laughs> Getting me to listen to Lewis. <laughs> anyway. Oh, man. Oh, we can have fun anyway. Uh, let's look at Proverbs 21 5 out of the NLV, a little different translation. Good planning. And hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Amen. Now that really says it right there. Good planning and hard work. If you want to advance in your career, plan, work your plan, and work hard. And guess what? You'll prosper. <laughs> Amen. Now, here's the thing. You, you do have to do what God instructs you to do financially. For instance, I said a while ago that you got to be a tither and a giver. Well, the tithe belongs, as we know, to the local church, to the storehouse. That's the local church. And so, Blen and I have been tithing our whole buried lives, okay? And we tithe regularly. And I don't say that to brag or anything. That's just the way I was raised. I was raised understanding about tithing. And I, I tithe every month to the church. And uh, I don't miss it. You know, my dad had a little thing. He, he took uh, 10 silver dollars, and he would stack those 10 silver dollars up, and he'd take that one off the top, and he'd say, this one off the top is all God requires. And he set that aside. He said, he's leaving you with the rest of this. And I thought, ooh, that's good. I like that. And I've always remembered that little story, that little picture story of, of the coins, because, you know, Ten silver dollars back then, the big ones, you know, that were heavy, stacked up. When you're a kid, man, that looked like a lot of money, and it was cool looking. So that just stuck with me. And uh, so I've been tithing. But then beyond that is giving. See, you don't give until you have tithed. A lot of people, well, I tithe every month. No, I don't see blessing. Well, you need to give beyond the tithe. Well, I don't want to do that. Well, if you want to have a Philippians 4.19 experience, you're going to have to qualify for Philippians 4.19. If you'll notice, Philippians 4.19 was written to the Philippian church, and when Paul wrote it, he said, Whoo, you guys are givers. You gave to my necessity. You gave above and beyond. You gave supernaturally more than you had natural ability to do. So they were tithers and givers. And then what did Paul say? He said, and my God shall supply all your need, notice, your need, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. In other words, that's for tithers and givers. Okay? So you got to meet the conditions. Just word to the wise there. All right, let's look at Exodus uh, 15.26. He said... If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do all that is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, 
I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I brought unto the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Now we're fond of reading the latter part of that verse, I am the Lord that healeth thee, in Exodus 15, 26. We read that and we know that that's a covenant name of God. Matter of fact, it's the first covenant name that he revealed to his people. Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that healeth thee. But the first part is a requirement. He said, if, notice, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do all that is right in his sight, and will give here to his commandments and keep all his statutes, then I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I brought uh, upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. He is the healer for us, his people, but we've got to meet the conditions. Charles Capps, when he was teaching on this one time, pointed out that the expanded meaning of this first part of the verse where he says, diligently hearken, is to listen to the word far, fast, holy, completely, louder and louder. <laughs> I like that. Far, fast, holy, completely, louder and louder. And the conditions involve that kind of diligence. Being diligent to do what God has asked us to do from his word. All righty, well, a couple more things that I want to share with you. The word diligent in the Greek is the Greek word spudadzo. Don't you love Greek words? Spudadzo, which is from another word. And that word is, is uh, in Strong's is G4710, if you ever want to look it up. And it means to use speed... This is spodadzo. To use speed, that is to make an effort. That's what diligence is. This is the word diligence in the Greek. Be prompt or earnest to give diligence, be diligent, endeavor, labor, and study. It's also translated study. We'll come to that here in a second. And then the word spude, which is the word that it comes from, means speed. That is, by implication, dispatch, eagerness, earnestness, Business, earnest care, diligence, forward, and haste. Now, let's look at 2 Timothy 2.15. This uses this word that's translated diligence in other places in the Bible, and it's the word study. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, every time I would read that as a kid, I think study to show thyself approved. Oh man, I gotta study. Gotta study the Bible. Well, that's true, but this word spude, spudadzo, all right, spude is the word it comes from, spudadzo, means to uh, to use speed, effort, earnestness, diligence to show yourself approved unto God. So this is where we need to be. We need to be diligent. That does involve study of the Word. That does involve applying ourselves and being diligent. 2 Peter 3.14 says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. That's that word, spudadzo. Let us labor, that's the word translated, from Spudadzo, let us labor or be diligent, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And there he was talking about where the children of Israel didn't mix faith with the Word. We've got to mix faith with the Word of God. We've got to apply ourselves. We've got to labor to enter into the rest he has for us. That sounds contradictory to us. Labor to enter into rest? What, well, what does that mean? Well, if you think of it as diligence, all of a sudden it clicks into place and makes sense. We're diligent to enter into rest. We're diligent to rest in God and His Word and His promises. And it really comes down to that conditional factor of doing what the Word of God says. Amen? So I trust you got something out of this tonight about diligence, applying yourself. Listen to the Lord. Cleave unto him. Study the word. Be diligent in the word. Be diligent to come to church. Be diligent to hear pastor preach and other ministers preach. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. It builds you up. 
prayed in the Holy Ghost. Jude verse 20. Uh, chapter 1 verse 20, but there's only one chapter in Jude. Beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, pray it in the Holy Ghost. Be diligent to pray in the Holy Ghost. Be diligent to study the Word. That's how these things begin to work. It works, and the best way I can put it, it works when you put it to work. But you have to put it to work. Amen? All right, did you get anything out of this? Praise the Lord. I sure did. I love this study. It just it just developed and grew and... Scripture's coming together. I just I get into that. Amen, as a teacher. Um, well, praise the Lord. We want to receive our offering for tonight since we've been talking about giving. And, uh, you know, any gift that we give, any tithe that we give to the church is going to in turn around and bless us. Praise the Lord. So let's pray and we'll receive the offering. Father, we thank you for this time set aside for us to study your word. We thank you, Father, that we have opportunity now to return to you our tithes and our offerings, and we just believe that these tithes and offerings will be used to fund the ministry of the church, the ministry of Expedition Church of the Triad here in the community, and reach people with your word. We thank you for it, Father, and we call ourselves blessed for obeying your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Jay, go ahead and receive that. If you're giving online, go ahead and give uh, with our electronic means, with uh, Square Cash, uh, which is dollar sign Expedition Triad. And then you can also give through PayPal at give at expeditiontriad.org. And uh, we'll uh, gladly receive your tithes and offerings. Your tithes really ought to go to your local church, so tr I trust you're doing that. But any offerings that you want to give, we'll certainly receive and, and use them for the kingdom. Praise the Lord. Don't forget, Sunday, Pastor will be back. Uh, don't forget, Shekinah Glory is coming in October. Ooh, I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be good. I'm going to be diligent to be there. <laughs> Amen. And as for tonight, you are dismissed. Those of you online, we'll see you next time. Remember, until then, to fulfill the Word of God.